Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, and welcome to the webinar and peer exchange on chairs fostering psychological safety, uh, which is a primer for sustainability and AI debates. My name is Lisa Lotengstam. I'm a chair of Boards Impact Forum. I'm also a member of the Global Climate Governance Initiative and a chair in Ed on a variety of listed and private uh, companies. We are running this uh, in collaboration with INSEAD and the Corporate Governance Center, um, which is, of course, focused on advancing the corporate governance practices, but also creating trust as agents for positive change. Um, we are three chapters out of 30 that is collaborating on this uh, one, and we are all part of Climate Governance Initiative in collaboration with World Economic Forum. Uh, and we base our mission of the principles for effective climate governance in Board's Impact Forum, we're taking a bit broader perspective. Uh, and uh, we are using the, uh, the topic uh, to be a broader thing. The agenda for today is that we will have a perspective uh, from uh, our professor, uh, on the uh, topic, and then we will have a panel uh, perspective. They will also share their perspectives. We will have a short poll. We will have group discussions, and then we will reconvene and we will have a panel discussion with all all uh, of our uh, presenters and panelists. With some concluding remarks from our professor, we ask everybody to be on mute. Um, that isn't speaking, of course. Uh, and I'd like to introduce to give the floor to Stanislav, uh, who will share pers uh, perspectives. Stanislav is um, a senior professor of both entrepreneurship and enterprise, and he's the co-director of Leading from the Chair program at INSEAD. And just so you feel also uh, jointly together, he's also a chair as the rest of you and has been so for over 20 years. So warm welcome, Stanislav. Do you want to run the presentation from your machine? Yes, I think that would be that, that would be more uh, there you effective go. and actually efficient. Thank you, uh, Liz, a lot. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, we had a short conversation between uh, the official opening and I said this is something that I'm really uh, excited about the, the, the event today, because not only it's very interesting for me sort of from a uh, theoretical perspective, but this is also what I'm facing on a daily basis in my in my current work as, uh, as a chair. So I'm really looking forward to a conversation that we will have today. And what uh, I would like to do, I would like to give you a little bit of sort of the conceptual perspective on uh, on the topic as a background of uh, our uh, conversations uh, uh, today. Yes, okay, very good. So uh, psychological safety, I, I have only 15 minutes, so it, it, it is going to be uh, sketchy, just, 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 just the, main, the main bullet, uh, bullet, bullet points. Uh, the concept of psychological safety exists for quite a few years, but uh, it has, be, it has become popular, I think, over the last 15 years, mostly because of the works of uh, Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School, who uh, emphasized the importance of psychological safety for uh, effective collaboration, especially effective collaboration that she called teaming, which is collaboration of people who do not know each other very well, do not form traditional teams, but uh, Collaborate on important uh, important topics and on important uh, on important projects, which of course is very relevant uh, to boards because boards consist of people who do not sit under the same roof, who have multiple affiliations, who uh, meet not that frequently, but deal with the most important uh, uh, issues of the organization. Uh, issues which are very complex and issue, issues which require effect, effective collaboration of uh, diverse groups uh, uh, of people. So why psychological safety is important uh, for boards? I think it's important that we, we understand this, right? Well, psychological safety is good because everybody talks about this. It's good because it's good for 
uh, from the humanitarian point of view. But I think we also need to recognize what are the specific benefits of psychological safety for, uh, for boards. Uh, again, if we look at the literature, we see that there's a number of outcomes uh, of psychological safety for groups. The first one is inclusivity. If uh, people feel psychologically safe, they participate. So everybody is part of, uh, uh, of the group work. The second one, it allows for exploration. So when you feel comfortable, you can try new things. You can do things which you are not very sure about. Uh, it leads to experimentation. Uh, it also provides support to people who participate in, uh, in group work. And it creates the feelings of fairness. Those are the sort of positive uh, psychological outcomes of uh, psychological safety in groups. What does it mean for boards? Well, if you have inclusivity, you probably have better quality of uh, the decisions that you make. The whole purpose of, ha of have boards consisting of different people is to make sure that we create high quality, we, we make high quality decisions because of the different perspectives that these people bring into, uh, into the picture. If you explore at the board, then you come up with the new ideas, you are creative and you innovate. You innovate at the board, but you also have or help organization to innovate. Experimentation, of course, leads to learning and growth at the level of the board collectively and individual directors. Support is very important, especially very important at the, at the tough times that we, we, we are living these days, because support leads to resilience, individual resilience, and as a result of individual resilience, the collective resilience uh, of the board. And, and of, course, we... of course, fairness uh, leads to directors' engagement and satisfaction. And if people feel good about being members of a particular board, they contribute more as a result, the board becomes, becomes more effective. So then number of good reasons why psychological safety is important for boards. So we should uh, try to instill psychological safety at, uh, at boards. However, when it comes to the practice of doing that, and that's what I, will, I would like to talk uh, about for the, next, for the next 10 minutes, is we see an interesting paradox that when you talk to directors and you ask them about psychological safety, all of them, virtually all of them say, well, this is extremely important. We really need to have a psychological safety. Psychological safety is something that we have to strive for. However, when you ask them, where should the psychological safety come from? Very often, I at least hear the answer, well, somebody should make sure that we have the psychological safety. As a director, I want to have psychological safety, but also I want to have someone who gives the psychological safety to me. And guess who is the someone? Most of the cases, it's the board chair. Directors expect, expect board chairs to create psychological safety uh, for them, which I think is not a very right attitude. And I don't think it's that's, that is the role of the chair to create the psychological safety of the board. I think it's a little bit more nuanced and we need to understand that one person cannot create psychological safety because psychological safety is a relationship. It's a product of what type of relationship takes place in, in, in the board. And every director is a part of this relationship. Relationships do not form from one side. They all this multi, uh, multi side. And if we, if we look at the works of Edmondson, again, as a sort of the classic on psychological safety, we, we will find references to relationships. When she talks about psychological safety, she, says, she talks about shared beliefs. So it's not about one person. It's not about a, sh a chair. It's about everybody who is involved. Sense of confidence, the confidence of every person who is there. And it's a team climate. So it's a relationship. And the role of the share is very important in building this uh, relationship. And specifically, uh, I think that the chairs have two things, two, two major roles to play. The first is enabling their board members to understand, to embrace the responsibility for creating and maintaining a psychological safety. It's not for me as a chair to do it single-handed. It's for us as the board to make sure that we have 
we have the psychological safety. So creating this mindset of joint responsibility, of assuming responsibility for the outcomes. And the second role is, of course, facilitating this process, being an active moderator of the emergence of psychological safety at the board, uh, at the board level. How do chairs do, or uh, how do chairs play this role? Um, for myself, when, when I look at what chairs do and I talk to them and uh, I ask them how, how they go about this, uh, I can see sort of the, the four areas or the four blocks of strategies that chairs, uh, the chairs apply to instill psycho to help to uh, create psychological um, safety. Uh, it's setting the stage it's making sure that directors understand what is psychological safety. They understand what the benefits of the psychological uh, safety, and they understand their role in creating psychological safety at the board. It's role modeling. It's showing what does it mean to act in a psychologically safe manner, and what does it mean to encourage other people to do it, Third, it's establishing the process that helps psychological safety at the, on the one hand and builds on the psychological safety on the other hand. And the fourth one, it's reinforcing all those things. And sometimes we call it promoting culture of uh, psychological uh, safety. Those are the sort of high level, high level strategies, which I think is more important and of course more interesting are the specific practices that chairs use to promote psychological safety within each of those four uh, four blocks. I've uh, put on those slides some of the practices which I find are very relevant, but of course there are many more practices that chairs use to um, create psychological safety at the board level. So if we're talking about the first one, the setting, setting the stage, which I think is very critical, and unfortunately uh, often we skip the stage, we think, well, everybody understands what is psychological safety. Everybody understands what, uh, uh, what why psychological safety is important, and everybody under, uh, understands that we all need to work uh, towards psychological safety. This is a wrong assumption. We should not assume that is that's the the fact that we we have to work on this with the uh, with the board members. So what what I think are relevant, which practices? Uh, I think the initial discussion that a chair has with the new board member, this the onboarding interview, there should be an element about psychological safety. It has to be mandatory that we talk to newly uh, elected directors about psychological uh, safety. During this discussion, the chair should, should talk about what are the specific behaviors which I expected, what in our board means to act in a psychologically safe manner, and what in our board culture means to help other people to feel psychologically safe. Those behaviors may vary depending on, uh, on the context of the board, but they should be articulated and they should be communicated to every new board, uh, board, board, me board member. Um, I think a good practice, especially when you have a new board or if you're just starting to uh, talk about psychological safety, to have a special event which is dedicated to psychological safety, kind of a workshop. You can have an expert who uh, comes and talks about this, but most importantly, you have a conversation between the more board members of what is psychological safety, why is it important for us, and what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean uh, for us? Some boards and some chairs uh, send their directors to uh, external training about psychological safety, which is, I think, also very, uh, very useful. Role modeling, again, another very important, uh, very important instrument. You cannot have psychological safety unless you show what it is and you help other people to, uh, to behave and uh, yeah, to act in a psychologically safe uh, uh, manner. So what are the things that chairs do? Uh, giving full attention to directors when they're speaking, validating their feelings through em empathic listening, making sure that you use your body language to, uh, to help people to feel comfortable, uh, being consistent and predictable, very important for you as a chair. People need to know what to expect uh, from you under which uh, uh, situ situation. 
speaking the last, not taking too much space in the in the boardroom, making sure that the room is left to other directors. I think we all know that the good practice or the good target for chairs is never speak more than 10% of the air, uh, never take more than 10% of the air time. Uh, refraining from quick judgments, dismissals of director's perspective, actually refraining from the judgment as uh, much as possible. And, uh, you know, being showing your your personal vulnerability. This is very important. Some chairs think that, you know, they have to be iron ladies and iron men without any weak spots. That does not help psychological safety. Uh, I should not be afraid to acknowledge that uh, this is a new industry for me. I'm not an industry expert, so I'm relying on your opinions for the industry views or risk management is not my strengths. Uh, I'm learning, I'm working very hard on developing my expertise in this area, but this is not something where I can consider myself uh, uh, an expert. Fair board process, very important for psychological uh, safety. Uh, I believe that setting rules, board rules, very simple board rules, uh, is a great way to uh, uh, encourage psychological safety. Some simple rules I can think about is equal airtime. So we agree that nobody should monopolize airtime at the board meeting. All opinions are welcomed, respected, and discussed. We do not reject any opinion. We don't put it aside without considering it and without explaining why we not uh, uh, continue with this with this opinion. We support each other unconditionally. We are members of the same team, but we challenge our each other's opinions. We don't do it because we want to offend people. We want we do it because we want to raise the bar because we want to make sure that our board makes uh, very good uh, decisions. Consider failures as opportunities to learn rather than in uh, an <laughs> correctable uh, mistake. Uh, I think it's very important to use a variety of discussion models depending, depending on, on the situation rather than rely on the free flow model only. In camera sessions, when executives are not present, I think very important element of building psychological safety at boards. Um, asking every directors to state their opinion if people don't don't volunteer, soliciting information from directors who are having problems to uh, to express themselves in the boardroom, uh, avoiding voting. I think voting is anti psychological safety instrument that creates divisions at the board, and it takes a lot of time to heal those divisions. And uh, I best, uh, express evaluation after every board meeting. I think it's a very important instrument for promoting psychological uh, safety. And uh, sort of how, how do you make sure that safety becomes part of your culture? Well, we build culture by doing simple things. First, repeating what we, what we said. So from that perspective, repeating the board rules at the beginning of every meeting is probably not a bad practice. Uh, the second, making people part of the uh, solving the problems and working with challenges. So if we have some deviation, make sure that every board member is uh, is involved in this one. Uh, expressing gratitude, uh, acknowledging that people are contributing to psychological safety, offering coaching and mentoring either by the chair or by, by professional uh, coach and uh, making uh, psychological safety an important element of board uh, evaluation. Those and other practices, they can, uh, uh, they can uh, help chairs to foster uh, psychological safety at boards through other board members. Again, you cannot do it on your own. You have to make sure that it's the task for the whole board. And I think the last point I wanted to say that we all very excited about psychological safety these days. Uh, uh, it's a lot written about psychological safety. We have this event about psychological safety, and this is all positive, but we also should recognize the risk which I associated with promoting psychological safety. We should not uh, do it for the sake of psychological safety, right? We don't promote psychological safety because we want to promote psychological safety. I think we, all, we always have to be pragmatic and we should see some specific outcomes for our board if we have high level of psychological safety at uh, at this board.
And also, I, I don't think we should look at psychological safety as, as a license to avoid any accountability of individual directors, right? We should not give a license to a person say, well, I felt unsafe, uh, I feel I felt unsafe, so I did not participate in the discussion. I'm not accountable for the outcome of the discussion. By default, if you become a board member, you become accountable for collective decisions of, uh, of that board. And I think we need to, to remind the board about, uh, uh, about this. And we need to look at the psychological safety as an enabler of effective board uh, work rather than the thing in itself. Thank you so much, Stanislav. And I find your perspective so interesting because it also gives it back to all of us as part of the boards. Um, now I have the immense joy of also and we You will come back on the panel uh, again, uh, Stanislav. So now I also have um, the immense joy of introducing three panelists. So we have Nick, uh, Nick who is um, a chair and Ned on uh, living in Hong Kong, sit on Hong Kong companies, real estate, the Hong Kong exchange, but also sit on UK companies as the London Metal Exchange and others. Uh, welcome, Nick. We have Katarina Bunde. Uh, she is a chair of both listed and private companies in both Sweden and US. Uh, welcome, Katarina. And we have Rolf, who is both a chair and also an executive coach. Uh, so he plays a double role, which is very interesting. And he sits on boards in Germany and in UK. So warm welcome, everybody. And I thought I'd start with asking Nick to share your perspective first. Lisa Lotte, thank you. And uh, thank you, Stanislav, for the last 20 minutes. Really very interesting. Um, I just wanted to make sort of three points in three areas. One is the nature of board meetings. Um, the other is expertise we seek in board directors, both soft and hard. And then the uh, balance between informing directors and expecting directors to be curious about the business and the board that they're on. So those are kind of three areas I wanted to make comments on. As regard the nature of board meetings, sitting on and chairing boards, which are listed companies or regulated companies, such a large part of the board meeting is set aside for approvals, often immediately before announcements, et cetera. And it really is a challenge to find the opportunity for debate when there isn't a need for a decision very quickly. Um, the way that I try and do that is, um, is firstly quite a lot of, if you like, ad hoc board meetings where we will have specific sessions on AI, on sustainability, but most importantly, strategy. And those meetings are where a, a, a freer flow, if you like, of discussion might take place. Um, a great deal of one-on-ones with individual board members. Um, in order to make sure that they are able to put across their views, either one-on-one -on -one as well as, uh, as in a board position. Um, the, the, as regards, um, if you like, level of expertise, um, I, I do feel that being a board member is an acquired skill and, and not an innate skill. And, and so when I'm hiring or seeking to appoint directors, it is often, do they have those skills to start with? Very often, though you are seeking some deep industry or other expertise that will enable directors to deliver straight away. And there is that element of how you're going to help them uh, to acquire the board skills that are needed to um, be part of the, you know, the whole board in, 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 in facilitating PS. And, and kind of thirdly, a, a, a subject close to my own heart, which is, the extent to which you need to inform directors versus the extent to which directors should be informing themselves and being very curious. Um, I once asked a, a, a seasoned chair about how he approached this, and he absolutely said, I, I assess people for their curiosity first and foremost. I, I said, what's your proxy for that? He said, I look at what technology they use, what phone they've got, what iPads they use, what watch they wear. 
um, because technology is kind of the, the frontier of curiosity. And so I expect my board directors um, th that I should inform them and they should be have the induction, but also I have a big expectation of what they do, how curious they are in, in what they do. So, so really those three areas for me, the nature of board meetings, the expertise on, on appointment and this balance between informing and expecting self-education. Thank you so much, Nick. Now we will all look down on our watches and see what we have. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Katarina, what is your perspective on the topic? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think this is a, it, it's a great topic that um, usually is the big divider between um, very productive outcomes of a board and inefficiency, which is um, usually the inefficiency stems from not being able to uh, utilize everyone on the team. Um, I mean, uh, it is a team sport and uh, all teams need a leader, uh, the chair, but um, all members need to contribute as in all teams. So I think one thing that I like to do as a chair to begin with, especially with, when you have new people on board um, is to ensure that you have social activities so that people get to know each other socially. Um, if I have had dinner with people, if I've been talking about things outside of their role as a board member, um, I will be much more open. I will be more prone to, sh to share other things um, that also belong uh, both in the boardroom and outside of the boardroom. So that's one thing I think is really important. It could be board dinners before each meeting it could be lunch afterwards whatever you know works for the particular group um, another thing is to engage the board in shaping the board agenda for the year i usually like to start the year with an um with a both an open discussion um you know what should we include besides our <laughs> annual cadence um and i usually do that as both an open session and then i also use um a tool like Mentimeter or some other voting activity so that all voices can be heard and we prioritize. And then we have this list of things that we'd really like to sprinkle into the year besides all the um, um, all the governance that, that we need to do. Um, and um, another thing that I like to do as an activity in the beginning of each board meeting is what I call an ear to the ground. It's a little bit like what Nick talked about, the curiosity. Um, so we start with an open, just 10 minutes. Has anyone heard anything going on in the industry? Any <laughs> gossip about competition or partners of ours or new things happening in the industry? But I, my, la my last point was just this ear to the ground activity be in, in the beginning of a board meeting. And one of the reasons for that is that some people can contribute with things they've heard in other areas that may or may not be pertinent to the actual agenda for the day, but as a way for some people to, especially new people um, that may contribute with something they know about what's happening in the industry or in some other um, adjacent industry. Thank you so much, Katarina. I think that going around the table is a fantastic. I also use that. And the interesting thing is, kind of the third board meeting you have this, then they have looked outside. So if they haven't done it before, they really do it after a couple of whiles. I really like that one. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you're also on the board of Mentimeter, and I'm actually really fond of using that as a way to get a lot of opinions up before you start to, to actually sort it. So, so thank you so much for sharing that. Rolf, what is yeah. your perspective? Thank you. Well, I've, <clears throat> I've learned that whenever I meet Nick, I will not wear my watch because I'm a fan of mechanical watches. So it would kick me out of that. So, um, or maybe I can say that this is my sense of quality. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, I would like to to build on um, what the other panelists have said and and add a few a few things because obviously go, going last means to. The, the, the place to contribute goes narrower, but there are a few things I'd, li I'd like to add. One is that um, building upon what, what we've heard also from Stanislav, um, this idea of you want different perspectives on, on boards in order to have a rich conversation, 
broad outlook, know what's what's going on in, in the world as as being um, a main ingredient for successful board work. At the same time, that means that everyone will bring their own patterns. Um, humans are great at building patterns and behavioral patterns, um, perspective patterns that we bring, uh, we run autopilot and we need to be able to be to be aware of the autopilot we bring and chairs in particular need to be aware of how these autopilots come together and and then what to make of those autopilots and when to use them because they can be super helpful and when to switch them off and and seek different approaches to conversation different approaches to interacting with one another and there is one element in particular that that I like to focus on which is this notion that very often people will be invited into into board director roles because they have an impressive track record in something and this impressive track record quite often means they've been a leader in places where they have operated now as a board member they suddenly have to be a member of a board a member of a group a member ideally of a team and I find that very often we're not sufficiently aware of what it means to be a member and when to show up as a member and contribute as a, as a member and when to step up to be a leader. And the idea of I may be a leader in many areas of my professional life, but now that I sit on this board together with you, Katarina, or together with you, Nick, or together with you, Liz Lott, I have to be a member mm. and my contribution may be different mm. from that perspective than if I felt I, I'm the leader here. Mm. But yes, you want to be helping to lead conversations, mm. but there's that fine line between these, these two roles. And I find that that is, is important to, to pay attention to mm. can also be a great, perspective to use to provide feedback both in one-to-one -one conversations but also in in the full board conversation along those lines of how did we do hmm. uh, what else could we do next time what could we do to be even more effective than we've been this time around thank you so much rolf um and i think to be honest, I think we all struggled when we got into our first board positions to step down from our leadership roles and actually become this member of a very new creature of things. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things I really have to start to ask you all, because you all sit in on boards in different countries. So, of course, I need to ask you, does the cultural background play in? more or does the type of board and ownership structure play in more do you want to start on that nicholas um in in in, a, in hong kong um we have a vast proliferation of family-owned businesses both listed so absolutely sponsoring shareholder companies have i think a different board culture i'm not saying it's a you know a, a worse or a better one but it has a different board culture and mm. perhaps a longer term a longer term view i also you know am of the view that the importance of diversity and often geographical diversity around the board table because people in hong kong think they are internationally brilliant and understand everything that's going on everywhere particularly china and we don't we we have a sort of group think and so trying to make sure that you get that balance is critical so you're right Lisa. a lot of those are important challenges for putting together a good board right so um I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody who answered the survey and uh, that we uh, pulled out and one of the interesting topics on that this goes also for all of you was that uh, the people who responded didn't particularly think that the diversity of their boards contributed to the discussions and debates what is your perspective on that? And then I'll go on to Katerina. Are you asking me that question? Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Um, no, I, I would I would disagree. I think that Hong Kong is a jurisdiction that has been much slower 
on gender diversity than other jurisdictions, um, an, an area that I work on very hard. And I do find that as one moves uh, uh, along a, a continuum of gender diversity, you mm. get a much richer discussion. And, and similarly on geographical diversity or background diversity. So I, I wouldn't agree with that statement. I would say right. that, that you get a richer conversation. Thank you. Katarina, what is your perspective? You see kind of on both listed, on scale ups, Sweden, US. What is your perspective on how that? Well, I, I do think that there are. Um, so to begin with, I think there's a huge difference between uh, a listed company where you do have independent and, you know, usually independent directors, uh, more professional directors, uh, diverse team versus um, especially um, founder led past growth companies where there's also, you know, the chair also has the task of trying to uh, to teach to teach people a lot about how you, <laughs> you know, here's the management team, here's the CEO, here's the board, here are the owners, we all have different roles. So there's also the, you know, the safety and what role you have. And I mm. think um, if you understand your role, there is a much higher safety in that you you know, okay, I'm supposed to do this kind of work, mm. take um, directions from this group of people, et cetera. Um, one thing um, that uh, differentiates the Nordics from a lot of other jurisdictions is the nomination committee set up. Um, so in the Nordics, the nomination committee consists of uh, representatives um, from the three largest shareholders. Uh, this is um, uh, this is a must for um, listed companies, and it's become best practice. So that is usually how uh, private equity-led companies and other companies also do it. Which means that it's not the board chair or the board who suggests uh, new board members. It's the owners. So you actually have sometimes. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not going to go on with war stories, but you have a situation where owners try to insert the owner agenda um, through, uh, you know, into the boardroom in a way. At the same time, um, it's it's a really good model uh, since you don't have the board, so to speak, suggesting their own um, safe friends to join the board. So, so there's a both, you know, a bit of a plus and a minus with that model, and that makes a huge difference, actually. Right. Thank you so much. What What is your perspective on the multi-country backgrounds and and the different types of boards, Rolf? <clears throat> I I would actually prefer to answer a slightly different question, if I may. Okay, put out the question um, because <laughs> there is an element that that we have overlooked so far that I think plays an important role, which is it's connected to your question. So it partially answers your question, okay. but it also picks up on the on the topic of psychological safety. And that is this notion of um, language. All right. um, we, we need to be aware of the fact that when this happens in English, native speakers have a natural advantage yeah. over non-native speakers. Yeah. I recall a conversation with a, a former colleague of Nick, 35 years of PwC, who said, you can take any meeting, any group, in any country, any anywhere, it'll take 15 minutes for the native English speakers to take over. Now, <laughs> how do you foster psychological safety when you've yeah. got multi multiple languages on the board? Mm. How do you create the space where someone who cannot express themselves mm. in the way they would love to and therefore have reduced capability to participate. How, how do you create that? And, yeah. and how do you respect that? And how do you play to that? And to me, that sometimes is a much more important element to how board members interact with one another. Yeah. I totally get the point of the regulation and clearly the difference between listed and non-listed companies. Um, but I think that's an element that we need to pay attention to um, right. as well. And now I'd like to invite back our panel. Uh, I'd like to ask 
Stanislav to first uh, actually reflect a bit on the uh, the comments that were made and also the poll. Okay, let me let me could I share a practice from my group because I think it's it's quite yes, relevant. absolutely, yes. absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that the practice is you should if if you really want to have psychological safety on your board, but also if you want to make progress in uh, uh, issues as complex a, as AI, uh, you have to face the, the reality and you have to acknowledge the lack of knowledge. And then collectively, you should decide how do we work uh, about closing this gap? So, okay, we, mm -hmm. we don't know much about AI, so let's find ways to uh, develop some knowledge about, about AI. I think that that was very, uh, that, that was very good. Uh, you know, the, recognizing the deficiencies and then uh, collectively deciding on how to deal with those uh, deficiencies. Uh, my 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 reactions uh, to sort of uh, the the discussions that uh, took place early and uh, uh, to the poll. One specific point uh, about diversity uh, and the native native speakers. I uh, think why diversity is not is not contributing. I think there could be two potential explanations. The first one: there is not enough diversity. Uh, sometimes we go for sort of formal diversity. We want to have fifty percent men and fifty percent women. Uh, mm. Actually, I don't know how that's going to work because now we have more than two genders and. In a few years' time, we we will be struggling with with this one. But uh, uh, and uh, we want you know we that's 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 where we stop in in uh, in our diversity, and then maybe does not bring enough 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 diversity to the to the boardroom. The second reason is potentially a, that there is no psychological safety for diverse opinion to be expressed. Mm. We do have those opinions, but when they're too diverse from the mainstream, the people just are not comfortable expressing expressing mm. them. And I think both the hypotheses could be could, could be true. And uh, about the native native speakers, I think that's a great example of where there is no psychological safety. Yeah. If you have native speakers who take over in fifteen minutes, that you have a dysfunctional board. Mm. There are no good rules. And the good rules should say, well, everybody should have uh, equal equal airtime. Mm. There is no respect for vulnerabilities of other people, and mm. there is no effective sharing. I think that's that's a good example when boards simply do not have mm. psychological safety and they have not worked on this. I've been on many boards with both native English speakers and mm. non-native English speakers. They're very effective words without any dominance from from anyone. Mm -hmm. I was on other boards where you had non-English speakers, non-native English speakers, and the language was English and it was dominated but non non-English speakers. So I don't think it's so much the the language proficiency. I think it's the quality of uh, uh, of the board process. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, just the last last comment, I think both from okay. from the poll and from from the discussions that we had, okay. AI seems to be more challenging uh, thing than sustain, sustain, mm -hmm. sustainability. Uh, but I think because it's so self self encompassing. Mm -hmm. But we should not be afraid of that. If it's more challenging, it means it's more also more promising. So we mm -hmm. we should just uh, make sure that it's continuously discussed at the board level, and we also improving the level of knowledge in this area of of the board. <clears throat> Right. And um, thank you so much for that. I will now go in the totally opposite direction. And that is, I think all of us has been chairs. Uh, we also always have troublesome directors that kind of takes over the boardroom in some ways, which is not very conducive of psychological safety. So what do you do then? as the chair, how do you work with that? What is your perspective, Nicholas? Or have you been fortunate not to have that? Um, I, I think that, um, you know, not using the, the Rolf approach of creating my own question to answer, but being fairly well connected to that question. I think that the big challenge is, in my part of the world, making sure that people recognize that 
director tenure is three years and then if you pass you get another three years and if you pass you get another three and that's yeah. been a very difficult process so actually um it becomes a chair responsibility if it is necessary to um have somebody cease being a director within mm -hmm. an earlier period and that kind of is the for me it is the chair's role it's not always easy you have right. to do it it's based on your relationship with them mm -hmm. so um, um but as, as i said in in my earlier remarks um for me a lot of my time is spent one-on-one -on -one with each of my right. directors um multiple times a year following a theme so that um if you are needing to deal with certain issues you have the wherewithal to do it right thank you so much okay, for another sharing comment i wanted to make was that um linking things up with with ai developments you'll soon have a machine you put on the table and you'll hear everybody speaking in their own language so that will be fine and they will give it out so we have equal time right <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Katarina, how do you work with actually handling also a bit of the, the more complicated uh, board directors uh, to create the psychological safety so everybody contributes? I think it's really important that um, you, you know, you, you can't just let one person, I mean, it could be different types of problems. You have the person who dominates the discussion, you have the one who clearly, for some reason, doesn't like another board member and is, you know, giving snide remarks and whatnot. Um, I, I like to have conversations with a person like that. I, I will take them out for coffee. I will sit down with them separately. And 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 before I do that, I, you know, I observe and I take notes hmm. because I can't just go to someone and say, you know, I, I think you're being a right. pest in the boardroom. I have to give examples of when it's not, not helpful. Because, you know, sometimes people will say, well, I'm just doing this to create debate. Yeah, um, yeah but this is not debate club. This is a yeah. place where we try to get to results. So um, so I think, you know, that part. And then sometimes I actually orchestrate that two people talk to each other. Mm. If, if there is, a, you know, the, the two of them or the three of us uh, sit down and talk because Right. You have to, you know, you have to discuss it. You have to put it out in the open. Yeah. I also think that uh, conducting um, board evaluations is a really, really good tool to um, get around all sorts of difficulties, not just this one, but other mm -hmm. ones. Um, you conduct an evaluation and it's actually a place where people can, you, you know, you can bore into specific topics more mm -hmm. and then the most important part is really the discussion that you can have based on the comments, because the comments are anonymous, mm. but you will, you know, everyone will read it and it will be obvious that, you know, some people have remarks maybe about, you know, an unhealthy conversation, an unhealthy climate, and then you can bring that up into the open. Mm. Mm. And, and thank you so much for that, uh, Katarina. I'll come back to you on this thing about trying to get feedback uh, to all of you. But let's start with Rolf first and, and pick your insights into this topic. How do you handle this more challenging board members? And actually, I'll add something for you. How much of that is handled in the boardroom and how much is handled outside of the boardroom? Um, well... I have to, I think, disappoint you. I'm not going to say anything new because I like the approach that Nicholas has described and the approach that Katarina has described. Correct. Most of this will likely happen outside of the boardroom. Um, obviously, that's uh, an element of you don't want to put people on the spot. That mm. will not help psychological safety. Mm. However, there is one thing I'd like to add, and that is once there is a almost a routine of having mm -hmm. conversations one-to-one -one. and I'd say ideally this is something that happens anyway mm. because if you only have those conversations with the difficult people then yeah. the ones who are not difficult do not receive equal attention so right. I'd, I'd say why not have these conversations with everyone even yeah. though that means more time invested but mm. that creates more equal airtime, going mm. to the point that Stanislav made earlier. Also equal airtime outside of the boardroom mm. as a starting point for saying, 
And next time around, we're going to we're going to reserve half 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the end of the meeting to assess how we did in this meeting. Yes. So gently try and bring the conversation into the boardroom mm. after it's happened outside of the boardroom, mm. which could be an element to, to building the sort of awareness building and assessment. Mm. And we we all pay attention to one another and we all pay attention to how we conduct our conversations as a board. Mm. Uh, which would be your way to implement one of those ideas that Stanislav mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, and um, one of the things that has come up uh, a bit more now than before is that we're we're a team, or a, we're not a team, but at least we are a group. And um, we meet much fewer times, but we're going to take decisions on much more complicated questions. So in some settings, there starts to be this thing that maybe we should try to figure out. Maybe we, when you're on a leadership team, it's actually quite common that you do a test uh, in some kind of, of, of way and actually share that and have a discussion around I'm like this and you are like that. And this is how we will understand each other. Do you see that coming into the boardroom or do you have another way of actually bringing that in? I think I'll start with Stanislav who gets this from a bit broader perspective. I think this is very useful. Uh, we all know that if the better you know the people with whom you work, the more comfortable you become, uh, the higher the level of trust and the higher the level of psychological safety. So I think uh, there are different ways of uh, providing this knowledge to other board members. Some boards, I, I was involved, I think two boards in, in, my, uh, in my experience, we did the psychological test and we shared the, uh, the profiles, the personality mm -hmm. profiles with each other. And that worked very, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, some boards where people don't feel comfortable doing that, you may have a discussion uh, mm -hmm. among the board members and then people talk about themselves and about their patterns of behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's coming into, in, into the boardroom and the more of that we do, uh, the high level of psychological safety is going to be. Right. Thank you so much. Um, now, Katharina, I'll, I'll get over to you. I'll ask the same question. Do you see this coming up? And I also know that you are uh, using Mentimeter. Can you share something on how you're using that in the boardroom and, and what it helps you with? And for everybody, it's uh, maybe you can also describe what it is, Katharina. I think you're on mute. Yeah. No, very fast. I mean, it, it's a tool to um, for for collaboration where people can use their phones to um, to chime in on various. I will, for for example, I'll use it for a strategy session um, where I, you know, we're trying to pinpoint and and prioritize and rank various alternatives. Um, so I will throw that up. People will so vote with their phones, and then we can all see the results. But even more so, maybe we, we have some tough financial decisions. And instead of just ranking, we'll have a little more complex question where you can put in, you know, prioritizing topics, but also second and third priority and differentiate. So you can get into it. But everyone is participating um, and everyone's voice or, or opinion will be seen you see it on the screen and then then i actually usually start with asking okay the, the, here's the the result from the group are you surprised by what you see right. because a person who has a very different mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. from like the average from the group will say no 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 i would never prioritize this thing in the you know at the mm -hmm. at the bottom this is really important to me mm -hmm. so instead of me setting the priority we have the group creating you can say the group think and then you ask each one to challenge the group think right. um, so that's one way of drawing out from the group what they would not like to see if this was the actual outcome hmm. uh, so you're kind of reversing it from asking them what their priority is but say hmm. okay if this is if this is how we prioritize it or you know what are you not okay with Right. Um, so, so that's one way of, of uh, using that. Mm. Um, 
Thank you yeah. so much. Did for you have a second question? Maybe just one, yeah. one, one comment on this one. Yeah. I think it's it's a fantastic tool, the the you know the technology like this one because it it allows us to overcome the major challenge of all boards, engaged boards when people want to speak at the same time. And yeah. of course, when when we speak in a natural way, we we cannot do it. But when we have an instrument like this one, we can all speak at the same time. We can immediately see what the what what the picture is. And, and I have to say, I also use it and I find it extraordinarily good in not getting the dominant person to dominate the room, but everybody kind of gets, it, it becomes an equal voice kind of thing before you start the debate. Um, uh, so so anything from, from Nick that you're doing to try to equal out the voices and, and bring out the interesting topics? And now you're on mute. All right. I listen to that with interest because um, if I take the board that I chair, yeah. um, say a strategy meeting will be um, around which property asset classes in which geographies along the continuum of core to value add mm -hmm. do we want to be in as a company or do we want to migrate to? And frankly, it's very difficult to have that discussion mm -hmm. unless you have some deep expertise in the industry. Yeah. Because if you say to people without deep expertise, mm -hmm. what about Japan? Oh, I don't like Japan. You know, I like Japan. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, um, and so I, I, the longer I've been in the chair, the more I value the depth of industry expertise. Mm -hmm. And I find that a lot of discussions mm -hmm. Um, require that and the discussions that you might have as a group which, which doesn't have depth mm. is is somehow has something lacking a bit for me right and I think that's a very valid point and I guess Katharina you also bring in a lot of depth prior to you actually getting to to get the boardroom to vote uh, but I still think it's a very valid point because we are in, in, in terms of how quickly we need to act, all of us, we are easy to jump to conclusions. Uh, so, Rolf, what is your perspective on trying to get to? Um, well, I guess it's a blend of, of equal voice and also um, the notion of what can we do to get to know each other better, mm. just short off using an instrument. I'm, I'm a big fan of instruments, so I totally love the idea of using um, any good psychometric to help people understand in, and who they are, how they lo love to interact. And But mm -hmm. short of that, one thing that I've experienced in the past that's always worked really well is to, to start a meeting, going around the room, having um, an honestly interesting conversation around how are you today? And, mm -hmm. and perhaps also what's been, what's been going on in your life recently that may impact how you show up today. And, and that is something we all have stuff going on in our lives. And it is a way to see more of that individual and not just the role, but also the human being that that mm. is that role. And, and that can be a nice way of a fostering a more open conversation mm. um, and also getting to know each other better, which will then help with psychological safety. And, and the like so it may be counterintuitive most people mm. first glance say really and when they've done it they say hey this is actually pretty good yeah let's do it again <laughs> right and and that's very interesting let me just uh, in the final end here try to get it over to now you have all of these to topics that comes in with quite dramatic impact quite quickly so how do you Maybe you can't wait to actually have a discussion once a year. How do you facilitate? Um, because one of the, the 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 things that we hear is also that it's quite disruptive if if people just put it on the agenda very quickly without really having it on the agenda and and maybe as Nicholas said, uh, have a bit of depth beneath it. So how how do you bring in new topics? And um, maybe we want to start with Katarina this time. Yeah, so so I think um, I think there are two things to this. Um, on the one hand, you want to get people up to speed on 
you know, learn about it. Uh, mm -hmm. When sustainability measuring was new, we did a lot of training. Um, I think it's important to separate out training from actual board meetings. Mm -hmm. And I think actually, I think it's important to do it as a group. Yes, mm -hmm. people can go and do their own whatever classes, but it's what we experience as a group together. It's our discussion when mm -hmm. we hear an expert and we put it in relation to the particular company whose mm. board we're on. So mm. I think it's important to do it as a group activity, mm. bring in an expert, bring in someone. Sometimes the organization have the experts actually. I mean, sometimes your, your company has a, you know, if, if you're, especially if you're in a technology company, chances are that, you know, there are some people there that really know things or mm. you bring in a neutral mm. expert. So that's the training part. The other thing that I think is really important for the actual board work is to tie whatever it is to the company goals. Mm. You, you have to tie it into, is this something that's going to make us more productive? Is this something where we're going to be able to reorganize our company? Is this a way to, to work differently? Mm. Ways of working. So you really have to look at, okay, let's, you know, we're not going to, you know, bring in AI into everything we do mm. next month. You know, let's, let's tie it into our corporate goals because then it's real for everyone yeah. on the board and on the management team. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing that, Nick. And now we can't hear you. I was listening so intently to what Katerina said. I wasn't sure what the question was again. But um, um, uh, I, I think uh, the, the, the comment that, that I would make um, is that very much around having in, in the world of Zoom that we live in, you have the ability to bring in expertise to speak to the board. Oh on subjects outside the, the general cadence of board meetings where you have a lot of stuff to get through. And, and, I, and I'm a big believer in doing that. And I found mm. that that's been a very good way to do it. And, and absolutely agree with Katrina about bringing it onto balanced scorecards. So that if you have mm. objectives around AI or sustainability specifically, um, then if it's not on a scorecard, it ain't going to get done. And so making sure that it sits there and is properly described and worded is the way to do it. Mm. Very good. Thank you so much. Rolf? Um, the, I agree with Katerina. I agree with Nick. The only little thing I'd like to add is maybe this idea of the experiment of the month or the experiment of the quarter. Mm. Bring new things in labeled as experiments, because mm. that is going back to Nick's point around curiosity. That's mm. my way to bring curiosity. What's the experiment of the month mm. that we can we can run? Mm. Uh, because with the notion of experiment comes the idea of we're going to learn from this, whatever the outcome is. Mm. And, and that can make it safer to mm. to go into uncharted waters. Right. Um, and uh, and see what happens and see what we bring back and how that can make sense to to the business and then do everything that Nick and Katerina mentioned. Right. Thank you so much. I will now uh, hand over to Stanislav and ask you to do a short conclusion uh, for us on this super interesting topic that I'm sure we're going to come back to because it's not getting easier, but we will have to keep sharing a lot of the practices. Stanislav, over to you. Thank you, Liz, a lot. I think you already made a very good conclusion for the conversation that we had today, and that is it's a very important topic, and uh, we cannot really conclude on this uh, on this topic. Uh, I think what we what we heard today is yes, psychological safety is very relevant. Uh, we do not have a universal understanding of what the psychological safety it's probably very contextual and every board should have its own conversation about psychological safety what do we understand by psychological safety why psychological safety is important for us and how do we want to promote psychological safety to which extent and the board in, in the board of directors in china you probably will not have the same level of psychological safety that you have in the board in Denmark immediately. But every board has some room for improvement. You can all, it's never enough psychological safety in the board. I think that's, that's, that's the first conclusion that we can uh, draw from today's conversation. I think the second one is there are different specific instruments and tools that help to 
<laughs> promote psychological uh, safety and there's a long list of them and if we keep as we as we keep exchanging we can benefit from the knowledge of other uh, chairs and other boards in fostering psychological uh, safety and I think the third one is that psychological safety is not the goal in itself uh, the psychological safety is there to help boards to deal with the very uh, complex problems like uh, uh, sustainability and uh, and AI. That would be my three uh, points. Thank you so much, Stanislav. Um, and um, I could for sure go on for hours on this, but I need to <laughs> thank you all, Stanislav, Nick, Katerina, and Rolf for a generous sharing. We're very, very grateful for that. Also, thank you to the collaborators in Seattle Corporate Governance Center and the Climate Governance Initiative of Hong Kong and Chapter Zero. And of course, thank you to all in the audience for actually spending your valuable time and discussing these topics. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and for sharing your valuable insights. Thank you.